Hebrews chapter 13. Um, we've seen in the book of Hebrews as to how the writer to the Hebrews presents Christ as being superior. And I've said this a number of times, but we see him as being superior uh, in, in every way. Superior in the ceremonies, superior in the offerings, superior to any man or indeed any angel. And the reason why he is superior is quite simply because he is God. He is God in the flesh. And our text tonight is something that can only be said of God. And because Jesus is God, it is said of him. And so we're going to focus our attention on verse 8 tonight and a little bit into verse 9 as well. But verse 8, just a, sh a short little verse, but it is such an important verse in the Bible. It says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. So this is a tremendous truth. And of course, it's, it sets before us a, an important doctrinal truth. And the next verse is, is uh, very useful to us because it helps us to apply this doctrinal truth. Because what we don't want to have is just to have a, um, you know, a head knowledge of the scriptures. We don't want just our education of the word of God to be in our heads. We want it to apply to our lives. So we look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. And then we go to the next verse. He says, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. And then notice the phrase, he says, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. And I, I think it's because of who Christ is and because of what he does in our hearts and in our lives that we're able to say that our hearts can be established uh, by grace. So we want to concentrate our attention tonight on just looking at this important subject of the immutability of God. And it's a subject that isn't often spoken of nowadays, but it's such an important truth. Um, basically, it means that God, He never changes. As He was yesterday, as He was thousands of years ago, He is today, and He'll continue to be. He is... He is, change, he is changeless. In an ever-changing world, He is the only constant that there is. So He is as powerful today, and as loving today, and as gracious today as what He was in times gone by, and what He will be in time to come. And it's quite an important truth regards, regarding our great God. And it's an important truth because of this. It's because... When you think of change, either a person changes for the worse or they change for the better. So if God changed, then the argument then would be, the logical step would be to say, if God changes, that means that he can become more loving, that he can become more gracious. Okay, and you can see the problem with that, can't you? Because that means that he isn't that now. But God is absolutely perfect in all of his ways. He, he's not lacking in any way. And there's no way that in a, a thousand years or a million years that God will be better. He can't be better because he is the sum total of perfection. So to say that God can change, uh, that becomes a blasphemous statement because it says essentially that God isn't all that he can be today. He's going to be something better tomorrow. So we see very clearly that Jesus Christ uh, is God, and because he's God, he's uh, changeless. So in a world that is in a constant change, a state of flux, in a world where there's ever change, there's this wonderful constant. This, our great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the same yesterday, and he's the same today, and he's the same indeed forever. What he was in years gone by, what it is today, you will continue to be throughout eternity. And these are tremendous truths for us to think about when we think about our Saviour. So immutability is an attribute or a characteristic that is only, can only be said of God. So in the book of James we read in James chapter 1 that every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. So there's no variableness with God. There's no turning uh, with God. So we, 
you know, man can be fickle. A man can give you a, a gift, may be kind to you today, but then tomorrow they may not be in such a charitable mood, and then they unkind to you tomorrow. They may take the gift away from you tomorrow. But God is, of course, a, a God who does not change. He's not fickle. He's not happy one day, sad the next day. He is a wonderful constant. So all the gifts that we have come down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness neither shadow of turning. That's a tremendous thing to consider in the Word of God. And of course, uh, what is said of God is said of the Lord Jesus Christ as well. Uh, so there are a number of verses that speak about the immutability of God. Psalms 102 speaks about the immutability of God. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6, I am the Lord, I change not, therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. So all of these things that just remind us that God is an immutable God. And of course, Jesus Christ is indeed God. And so Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So in an ever-changing world, it's wonderful tonight that we can say that we have a never-changing Savior. We have one who is immutable. So this is a, a reassuring truth for us. And it's a comforting truth because... As we see, the, the next verse in verse 9 says that we be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. It's, it's, a, it's an occultic faith. It's, it's a devilish doctrine that doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And so the writer says, don't be carried about with diverse you know, some people have wondered, what's that word diverse mean? There was an old country preacher. He said, I'm going to preach the down diverse uh, sins. And uh, you've got diverse diseases. And everyone was listening. He said, you, this church, he says, when I'm finished preaching, everyone dives for the exit. Everyone dives for the, the car. Everyone dives for the restaurant or the golf course. Well, of course, that, what, that's not what it means, is it? Uh, it means that... Uh, you know, many different types. And he says that we're not to be carried about with many, with diverse, many different types of strange doctrines. Well, it's a wonderful thing to recognize that we can have a heart that is established with grace because we have a Savior who is the same yesterday and today and forever. And we saw this in the beginning of the book of Hebrews because we see in chapter 1 and verse 10, it says, Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, thou remainest. They shall all wax old as doth of raiment or garment. And as a vesture, thou shalt fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. So it's a tremendous truth when we think about the fact that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And I want to encourage you tonight as we just think for a moment about this tremendous verse and apply the truths that it causes us to consider regarding our Saviour. What are some of the things that will never change about our Saviour? Well, the first thing that will never change about our Saviour is the fact that He is all-powerful. That is something that can never change. He is pow he's not just powerful, He's all-powerful. We read in, in the Great Commission, in Matthew chapter 28, all power, Jesus says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. So we read that all power. You know, sometimes people say things like this. You know, they say something, and I guess they mean well. They'll say, um, I've decided to make Jesus Lord of my life. You know what? Well, Jesus is Lord of your life whether you decide it or not. He is Lord. He is all powerful. But the sooner we would recognize that the happier we will be and the more productive and fruitful we will be. But he is God. He is all-powerful. And so he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So think about how powerful he is. And we've seen this in the book of Hebrews. We know that Jesus is all-powerful because of his creative acts. Jesus Christ is creator. So we, we saw in chapter 1, verse 2, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. 
And when you think about our Savior, the one who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, He's all powerful. That can, nothing can change with that. He's all powerful. And we see this in His wonderful creative acts. In the Gospel of John, we read, All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So Jesus Christ, our Savior, is all powerful. He always was and He always will continue to be. And this is an encouraging thing for us because not just because you look out at creation and you can marvel in the beauty of God's creation, but also because you can look at the power behind it, the word that spoke this world into being, and realize that this power belongs to your Savior, the one that loved you and gave himself for you. This power belongs to the same one that invites us to come to the place of prayer. And the, the, that he would so often tell us to be a people of prayer. And he tells us that if we ask anything in his name, he will do it. This is his power. And we often use prayer as a last resort. When we've run out of options, then we'll pray. But instead of thinking to ourselves that God, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's all powerful. And Jesus says, whatever we ask, he will do it. In Ephesians chapter 3, the Bible says that he's able to do abundantly more than what we might ask or think. So that talks about his wonderful power in, in relation to his uh, creation. But his wonderful power is also seen in his redemptive acts as well. And we've seen this also in, in the previous chapter, in chapter 12, because we read that Jesus is not just the one who is the, sa the same yesterday, today, and forever, but Jesus is the author and he is the finisher of our faith in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. And so our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, he paid the penalty uh, for man's sin and he paid the penalty with his own blood and so Acts chapter 4 tells us that neither is there salvation in any other for there is no, none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved and so it's only through the Lord Jesus Christ so we look at his redemptive acts and we can say this is wonderful think about his saving power that is the same today and will be same in the future as what it was yesterday Jesus Christ the same. And then also, when we think about his uh, protective acts, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever, Jesus is still the good shepherd. He'll never stop being the good shepherd, the one that cares for his flock and tends to those that are in his fold. He will care for us until he brings us and leads us safely home. And so we can rest in this. The one that is the same yesterday and today and forever. We see his wonderful power in his creation. In his redemptive work. And then also in his protective work. As to how he cares for us. And doesn't he care for you? Have you can't you look back on your life and say, well, he has cared for me. We all can say tonight, you know, we've been in times such tight places where we we couldn't even see the light at the end of the tunnel you know it just was darkness we didn't know which way to turn but isn't it wonderful to know that he always was there and he always has come through for us and the fact that you and i are sitting here tonight are able to say god is faithful because here i am i'm living proof i was in a difficult situation but now i'm here and god has brought me through so our good shepherd he never does change he cared for you in the past and he'll continue to care for you, uh, not just in the present, but in the future as well. So when we consider his wonderful power, we're able to, you know, just glory in this wonderful Savior that we have. Uh, we consider his power in creation, in redemption, and of course in the way that he's able to protect us as well. But then the second thing that I would draw to your attention is also when we consider his promises that he gives to us. His promises. Now the Bible is a book full of promises. And we would do well to be able to differentiate when the promises are speaking to us specifically or if they're speaking to Israel. But 
there are many uh, promises are made to Israel, but the principle you can apply to yourself as well. There's so many great and varied promises. I like what what uh, Abraham, how he reasoned things out. We did look at this some months ago, but when, when God had called Abraham and told him to sacrifice his son, and he knew that in this son, his seed was to be called. Not in any other child, but in this particular child. This is how he reasoned. He reasoned that even if he was to slay his son, that he was fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able to perform. Because God is a covenant-keeping God. All the promises that God makes are always going to come uh, to fruition. So when God makes a promise... You can, all, you, can, you can bank on that promise. You're, you're able to rest and rely upon that promise because he uh, is true to his word. Let me remind you of some of the promises. I'm just going to share three or four. But there are so many in the word of God. But think about the, the promises specifically in relation to your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Firstly, the promise that he has given that he would save us. In Romans chapter 10, the Bible says that in verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now that's an easy promise to be able to grasp, isn't it? And, and you and I can recognize there was a time when we realized that we were lost in our sin and in our repentant hearts. We came to God, called out to Him, and the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon His wonderful name would be saved. And, and that's a promise, isn't it? And the devil will always try and get you to doubt your salvation. But you can just think to yourself, we need to just look at the promises and say, well, I, I've done what the Bible says. I, I believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've called out upon his name. And he has promised me that he would save me. We so often have doubts as we go through life's journey. The best thing to do is to doubt your doubts and believe God's promises. That's what we need to do. Just take your stand upon the promises that God has given to you in his word. And Jesus has promised that he would save you. And so you can take that. And there are many verses that we can just, when you think about your salvation, in John 3, 16, you know, the most well-known verse in the Bible, I would imagine, but it says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The devil, you know, gets under your skin and he's trying to get you to doubt the promises of God. You can just hold on to one of those promises. I believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's promised that I'm going to have everlasting life. And if I don't, then he's not going to be true to his word. So we just hold on to what God says in his word. Believe the, the promises of God. Don't believe the doubts that the devil would place in your ear. And so if you've trusted Christ as your saviour, then you can just rely on and trust in the promises that he saved you because he said he would. And he's going to take you to heaven because he said he would. We can just trust in his promises. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And then also he has promised to supply our needs as well. Paul said it like this, he said, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, he hasn't necessarily promised to provide for all of our wants, but he always does provide for our needs. And, and down the line, if we're honest, God has also given to us some of our wants as well, isn't he? We're not living on dry bread and water. The bread of affliction and the water of affliction, and that will sustain us as we go through life's journey. No, no, we've been able to have a whole lot of other things and beside. So, so he does supply, he provides for us. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6? He said, take no thought saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. So we're able to rest 
in his promises. The same, the same Jesus who provided a table for all those thousands in the wilderness, get the men and the women to sit down, and the children, and feed them, and how many baskets of fishes and uh, bread remain. The God that provided for the Israelites in their wilderness journeys for 40 years, they, they were provided for. He's going to provide for you and I as well. So we can, we can rest in his promises that he's going to provide for us. He always meets our needs. He always provides for us. And then also he's promised to satisfy us. You know, remember when Jesus spoke to that woman at the well in John chapter 4? And she was just thinking about how to get the next drop of water to drink. But he said to her, that, and he promised to her that he would give to her a, a drink that would satisfy eternally. And I've drunken from that same well, even the Lord Jesus Christ. And I find a satisfaction for my soul. And you too, who know Christ as your Savior, can say, I've also drunken and I've drunken deep. And I find true satisfaction in Christ that I could never find in the world. Now, I know you may be thinking that sometimes there are Christians who are kind of not satisfied and they're looking out to the world. But it's because they, you know, they're kind of like the cow. At, you know, they've got a perfectly wonderful green pasture. Not that I'm calling anybody a cow tonight. But they're, they're in a wonderful green pasture. There they are looking over the fence uh, at the grass, thinking it's green at the other side. When we get our eyes off our Savior, then we fail to, f to find true satisfaction in Him. We kind of think we're going to find it in the world. But he's promised to satisfy us. And he does satisfy. And so we, we need to just continue to keep our eyes uh, upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He's promised that he would. Uh, the Apostle Paul, we, we spoke about contentment a few weeks ago, but the Apostle Paul was able to say, I've learned to, you know, how to, I've learned how to be content in life. And I've learned how to be content with, if I've got food, I've got raiment, I've been happy. And the reason why I could say I've learned it is because his satisfaction didn't come from things and possessions. His satisfaction really came from the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, lastly, he's also promised that he would sustain us. By sustain, I mean that God has promised he's going to give you grace along the way. Because all of us go through times where we have difficulties. And again, my mind goes to the Apostle Paul and, and the difficulties that he experienced as a believer. And, and he said it like this. He, he prayed to God because he had a particular thorn in the flesh. And he prayed, he besought, besought the Lord three times, Lord, would you take it away from me? Now, we don't know what that thorn in the flesh was. But whatever it was, it was something that was severe. And he prayed, God, would you take it? And God said to him, Paul, I'm not going to take it away from you. But he did say this, but my grace is going to be sufficient for you. Now, sometimes you and I will go through some very difficult times. And he hasn't always promised to make our pathway <coughs> like a bed of roses as we go to on our journey to heaven. But he has promised that he's going to sustain us. And there's going to be some difficult times, some trying times. But we have this wonderful promise, my grace is sufficient. And so we can just rest in this wonderful promise that His grace indeed is sufficient for us. Whatever we have to face in life, uh, you might think, I'm not sufficient. And we, we really, we aren't. But He is. And He's promised that He's going to sustain us as we go through. And He's able to use every trial for your good. He's, he's able to use every blessing for your benefit as well. Because all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And so we just rest in his promise that he's going to not just satisfy us, but he's going to sustain us as we go through life's journey. So when you think about these promises, and I'm just mentioning just a few, but there's obviously so many more in the word of God. When you think about his promises, and you think about his power, and then you think about his person, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're able to rest upon that. 
it's important that, that Jesus Christ is who he is because if he wasn't, then you wouldn't be able to rest in it. You wouldn't be able to rest in his power because you think, well, is it sufficient for today, for what I'm going through? And you wouldn't be trusting in his promises because you'd wonder as to whether he would be true to his word. But because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever, you can rest in this. And it's a good thing for our hearts to be established by grace. In other words, to have this kind of confidence, that word established speaks about having a confidence. We're able to have this great confidence because we serve a God who never changes. So the immutability of our Saviour is such an important truth in the Word of God and it's something that we need to be resting on. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. And because He is, our hearts can be established with grace. So may the Lord encourage us as we just think about our wonderful Saviour, who He is, what He has done, what He is doing, and what He will continue to do for us. Let us pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word, and we thank the Lord for our time in just being able to consider our Saviour. We thank You, Lord, for Him. We thank You, Lord, for uh, the wonderful truth that we have salvation through His name. We thank You, Lord, that uh, He is all-powerful. We thank You, Lord, that His power is seen in creation in his redemptive acts. We thank you, Lord, that it's seen in our salvation. We're thankful, Lord, tonight that we can rest upon your wonderful and very promises. And we can rest in these things because your word tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Father, we praise you for that. And may we be leaning upon these truths. May you indeed use these truths to establish our hearts with grace. For we ask this in Jesus' name.